Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where we really like to start events on time and end them on time as well. Uh, I'm Errol Yawake, your host and moderator today. Uh, today we're talking about the perils and possibilities of using technology for migration management. We've got a really exciting panel, um, but before we get to them, I just wanted to frame our conversation in the, in the context of a broader thing that is happening in New York this week. So we are, at CSIS are hosting this event as an official side event of the 2022 UN International Migration Review Forum being held this week in New York from May 17th to May 20th. Uh, nearly four years after the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, member states, the UN system, and relevant stakeholders are convening right now in New York. Uh, and one of our panelists is actually stepped away from those meetings to, to her hotel room to participate with us here um, to share successes and areas for further progress relating to the implementation of the Global Compact and more generally, the pursuit of stronger international cooperation on migration governance. So the International Migration Review Forum is an opportunity for countries to turn their commitments to uphold the rights of migrants into action. Those commitments were made four years ago a lot of action has happened, a lot more needs to be done. The IMRF plans to harness the power of multilateralism in three specific areas. One, bringing, out more, uh, bringing about more inclusive societies. Two, supporting safe and regular migration. And three, reducing vulnerabilities that undermine rights and well-being. And it's around this third area on rights and well-being most specifically that we are gathered here today. Uh, digital technologies are often the core part of migration management systems. Uh, they make things more efficient and help countries manage the flow of people more effectively and comprehensively. Digital technologies used in migration management also come with plenty of downside uh, potential. So, especially uh, when it comes to privacy and the, and the rights of migrants. We have a great panel for you today, uh, and again, are honored to be part of the IMRF as an official side event um, as colleagues in New York and beyond reflect on the successes and challenges of implementing the landmark Global Compact on Migration. Um, two quick notes of, uh, of, of logistics. For more information on the IMRF, again, that UN conference going on right now, you can go to www.un.org slash en slash migration 2022. And lastly, if you've got questions for our panelists, uh, you can go to the event page for this perils and, and potential uh, event that we're doing on the csis.org website. So with that, you're going to hear a lot less from me throughout the course of this hour, and that's for the benefit of everyone. Uh, I want to turn first to Jessica Byther. Um, Jessica is a senior expert in, on migration at Robert Bosch Stiftung, um, where she is responsible for strategy development and political analysis covering the entire migration process. Uh, one of the reasons I'm really excited that she's joining us today is because her expertise lies in the intersection of technology and migration, and she has many, many years of experience working in and studying European migration policy. We've got Petro Molnar and Santiago Narvaez who are going to join us here in a little bit, but Jessica, if I could go to you first um, for any reflections on the overall uh, topic of the day, this using technologies, perils and possibilities. Uh, for technology and migration management. Thank you again for joining us from, from New York and over to you. Yes, um, great. Thank you, Errol, and um, hello to everyone out there on this topic that I do think is, is very important. And um, being here in New York um, has not really been mentioned all that much on the agenda and in the conversations that we've had. Maybe just uh, one step back for everyone listening who's not maybe heard of the Robert Bosch Foundation, where one of the large German foundations, and as part of our global issues area, we focus on future international migration and protection issues. And as one of these areas, this is where I primarily work in, is the, the role of digital technologies and how that may or will definitely, and I'll get to that, change the way we think about migration, human mobility, or 
protection going forward. So this is um, where I've been working in and uh, even before joining the foundation, I've always worked in the intersection of foreign policy and migration management and more recently uh, on technological issues. So this is also the perspective that I think I can bring to the table today in uh, working with policymakers as, as part of uh, a group that we run. Um, also in trying to think through these implications. Um, and maybe just a, a quick note of introduction to the topic or the, the way that I look at it, that is that in many conversations that we have with governments, but also implementers on the ground, I think all too often the way digital technologies are employed is still sort of seen and argued from a very technical aspect, like a technical policy aspect with arguments that you made, Errol, sort of that would make existing migration management processes more efficient, that it can help, that maybe it has some downsides, uh, but if we, we look at them, um, then th this isn't really of a concern. And I think the conversation that we're now starting to have and we need to have is actually that it is not whether digital technologies are gonna be employed in migration management, but that we really need to start asking the question how they're employed and according to which rules and principles and who gets to decide and sit at the table as we make these decisions. And so I think on the one hand, and we need to get more granular in terms of where are we using, are we talking about biometric identification systems, digital ID applications? Are we talking about algorithmic system being used in various areas of the process? And at the same time, we need to take a step back and ask the bigger questions in terms of how does this actually fit to the way technological regulation, digital standards are currently being discussed and developed in a world where this has also become a bigger geopolitical issue. And um, maybe I'll leave it at that for now, happy to uh, dive deeper into any of those areas, but this is maybe sort of the, the broader framing where I think this conversation needs to happen and um, is not happening yet. So thank you also for hosting this panel. Sure, thanks, Jessica. And I think that there's a lot to, to dig in there from the policies um, to uh, the, the intersection with other areas of focus like digital ID. I feel like there's a lot of energy around digital ID globally, and it's not, those dots have not always been connected. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Petra, if I could go to you next. Petra Molnar um, is normally in Toronto, although she's coming to us live from uh, Lesbos in Greece, which I'm hoping she'll tell us a little bit more about what she's doing there. Uh, Petra is the Associate Director of Refugee Law Lab. She's a lawyer and researcher specializing in technology, migration, and human rights. So again, perfect person to be talking with us about these issues today. Uh, she's currently working with EDRI, uh, Homo Digitalis, and other partner organizations on a project looking at the impact of migration control technologies on the lives of people on the move. And so, Petra, you've worked in rights, you've worked um, on these issues for years. You're obviously doing some very interesting stuff in the field uh, currently. Um, would love to get your, your initial thoughts. So over to you. Thanks so much, Errol, and thanks for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to join you today, and I apologize for any connectivity issues. I am indeed joining from the island of Lesbos, which is one of the sites where a lot of the technological experimentation that I want to talk about uh, today takes place. And I'll also be sharing some images as I kind of make my brief remarks just to situate some of these abstract issues um, on the ground because as you said i'm a lawyer but i'm also an anthropologist and so since about 2018 i've been spending a lot of time in, in border zones to see what these technologies feel like and look like and and particularly impact people who are on the move because i think at the end of the day it's really important to consider the broader ecosystem in which a lot of this technology is developed and deployed um, unfortunately, it is an ecosystem in which we are increasingly seeing anti-migrant policies, criminalization of migration, systemic racism, which makes a lot of border regimes quite violent. Um, the picture that I'm showing here, for example, is from the Sonora Corridor, uh, where I was in February. It's a, it's a zone of um, technological experimentation for many years in terms of the kind of traditional technology and surveillance that we are all familiar with, perhaps uh, drones, cameras, um, thermal detection, and, and all that. 
But unfortunately, it is also becoming a site where Israeli surveillance towers are dotted throughout the, the desert corridor under the guise, once again, of, of trying to say that perhaps smart border technology is, is something that we should all be excited about and, and turning towards. But I think what's important to think about is what does this kind of technology, uh, how, did, what, how does it impact actually on the ground? And as we know, um, border sites are already sites of experimentations. They are highly unregulated, as Jessica already told us. Um, they are sites where technology without governance and oversight uh, proliferates. And when I was in the desert in February, uh, the Department of Homeland Security announced that they are planning to roll out these so-called robodogs um, in this corridor, these quadruped military-grade technology machines that are essentially designed to patrol an already dangerous corridor. And really, that's what I want to highlight in, in just these brief remarks. These zones are already zones of violence and death. People who are making these crossings and who are exercising their internationally protected right to asylum often perish. Um, we had the chance to visit a number of grave sites, for example, that are unfortunately dotted throughout the Sonora, like Mr. Alvarado's that you're seeing here. But I know I've here. Um, I have been spending most of my time uh, in the last few years uh, along the corridors of Europe because similarly to the desert, the ocean is also a very violent border that unfortunately has ensnared many, many human lives over the last few years. And Greece in particular has become a testing ground for a lot of these migration management technologies. This is an island uh, camp uh, on the island of Kos, which is essentially a prison-like refugee camp that's replete not only with the kind of traditional um, surveillance technology again that we're used to, but also really, really far-fetched and experimental types of projects. Um, such as algorithmic motion detection software, drone surveillance, and even biometrics and turnstiles that people have to go through as they enter and exit the camp. And again, these, these camps, they really feel very prison-like, they're very stark, and you can feel this kind of omnipresence. And, you know, at the end of the day, and this is where I will end, we have to remember that there are real people who are at the center of, of a lot of this technological experimentation that is currently highly, highly unregulated. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, with people who have now been moved into a particular camp here in Greece. And one conversation that really stays with me is with a young mother from Afghanistan who was essentially forcibly transferred into one of these highly securitized, very high tech camps. And she quickly typed out this message and says, if we go there, we will go crazy. Because at the end of the day, you know, these conversations aren't really about technology. They're about power. They're about which entities get to decide what is innovated on and why, and why particular communities are time and time again historically pushed to the margins and made into these testing grounds when it comes to highly unregulated policies and technologies. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of hubris, I think, in this space. There is this kind of turn to the datification of, of the refugee response and this allure of these quick fixes that somehow technology is going to solve uh, these issues that we've all been working on for decades. But Really, these issues and these technologies don't address the systemic reasons why people are forced to migrate in the first place. And that is something that I unfortunately see every day, and um, I hope that I was able to illustrate a little bit of what is happening on the ground. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I when you were showing those photos before we started this, I thought you were showing photos of migration detention centers. I didn't think that you were showing photos of of a refugee camp. Um, and so that's uh, really uh, stark. I'm glad you shared those. Um, Santiago Narvaez is an investigator and a researcher at La Red and Defensa de los Derechos Digitales, a Mexican organization dedicated to the defense of human rights in the digital environment. Again, three for three, perfect panelists to be talking about these issues. Uh, Santiago, you're coming to us from sunny Mexico City. Uh, I believe, and uh, would love to turn to you and get your initial thoughts. Thanks a lot, Errol. Uh, also, thanks a lot to uh, CSIS for, for inviting me to the panel and for the rest of, of the panelists. It, it has been like a really good experience of doing that. Um, so, yeah, as you said, we are doing research on how this uh, surveillance technology is being used by the government of Mexico to, to stop uh, migrants, um, and what we, what we have seen is that the government is using biometric identification, drones, uh, also uh, mobile devices hacking, 
And all of this is being used to, to harass migrants, but also activists and, and journalists that are like working around this, this team. Um, and I think we need to understand that the adoption of these technologies in Mexico uh, is being pushed by factors such as uh, the securitization and the criminalization of, of migration. Also, there's like a, a tendency in, 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 in our country of uh, the militarization. In general, militarization, we have the uh, increasingly the, the like the intervention of, of, of the army and of the uh, Guardia Nacional, which is, which is like the security forces right now, uh, in, into stopping migrants, into harassing them. Um, and they are using this technology uh, in doing so. Uh, we also have to understand that this technology is being, uh, or, or initially, uh, it, it, it was adopted uh, through the donation of, of the United States government um, through Proyecto Merida, which was a, 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 a development and a security aid program that the government of the, of the United States uh, gave to Mexico to fight against uh, organized crime. Uh, and, and through these resources, uh, we are also seeing the, the adoption of, of, of biometric uh, identification, for example, to, to stop migrants. Uh, so these resources that were intended to, to be used against organized crime are being used to, to stop uh migrants so um right now uh one of the i would say that one of the pillars of the mexican uh, migration policy is to gather and to and to share information from 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 migrants to 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 the government of the united states um and uh as as we have been researching this we have been asking to the go to the mexican government how, how are these technologies are being used in 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 which framework or legal framework are they using them and and the like the constant that we have been uh, finding around this is that the the government is hiding like uh, telling us that they are not using these technologies or that they even don't don't have these technologies um but this is uh, contrary to some of the documents from the US government that specifically talks about these policies and talks about the Mexican uh, government, how, how, how they are cooperating into uh, gaining this, this information. Um, and I would say that these technologies are, are, use, are being used to, to, to stop uh, migrants for from even having the chance to ask for, for asylum. Um, as Petra was saying this, at the end of the day, this is technology, yes, but this is impacting how these people uh, are like exercising the rights to ask for, for asylum. Um, and, and these technologies are being used in the case of Mexico, not only in the, in the border in, in this area, but through all the, the country, like, um, because, uh, I mean, Mexico, the border happens to, to, to work in a different way as, as in other countries, I would say, um, in, in such that it is a vertical uh, border. So migrants face uh, detention and surveillance and, and, and the use of this technology, not only when they are crossing the borders, but throughout all the, all the country. And also we have been seeing that uh, this surveillance is happening even before the migrants uh, depart their countries. So uh, as migrants are like pick, picking up the use of uh, social networks uh, to, to coordinate, uh, to, to, to have these this caravans movements, uh, the government is uh, in these points are like targeting and surveilling people through, through social networks in, this, in these points. So that's, that's all for, for, for now. Um, unsurprisingly, we've started the conversation with a lot of the peril side of the of the coin, and and I do eventually want to get to some of the possibility side of the coin as well. Um, but I want to pull a couple of threads that I heard. So Petra, you talked about um, borders being highly unregulated spaces and sort of the wild west uh, in, in the United States, at least quite literally the wild west. Um, and I, I wanted to see Jessica 
you know, you've worked in this policy and regulation space for a while on migration uh, management, generally speaking, and, and more recently, you've, you've done work also in the digital space, uh, both at Robert Bosch Foundation and during your time at, at the German Marshall Fund. Um, and so when, when you hear Petra say, you know, these are unregulated spaces, like what does your mind go to? What regulations are needed? What policies are needed um, to regulate the use of technology in those spaces? Yes, sure. And um, thank you, Errol. I think there's sort of a few or maybe taking a step back to answer your question, because I do think what makes the migration refugee space so crucial to look at more closely with these technologies, and that's exactly what Petra and Santiago were referring to, is that the nature of migration refugee policy in these areas has always been more opaque and more discretionary, right? And so when we're talking about technology being employed in all of our lives, that makes this area even more crucial to look at um, because the questions that arise for individuals, but also for us, I would argue, as, as societies um, are so important. Um, now, when it comes to, to regulating and, and speaking of issues of, of governance, because that's where we basically need to get to, I don't think we are there yet. I don't think governments are there and asking the right questions yet. But as I was saying in the beginning, I think it needs two things, is A, to become more granular and looking at the type of technologies and taking a step back and looking at the bigger geopolitical picture and implications. To give one example, you mentioned the digital ID space and being used in this area. More and more, we're seeing sort of the unintended consequences of what this biometric collection could do. The typical example, it's been used a lot in the humanitarian sectors, right? Iris scans in refugee camps in Jordan to, to, to buy food with. Um, it's been used for different payment systems increasingly di different digital wallet applications can be used sort of to access services, um, but also increasingly tied to sort of digital ID systems, so biometric identification that has also been happening as part of cooperation, say, between European and African countries, that then would feed that information back to national digital ID systems being developed. Now, the thing with these digital ID or wallet applications is that it completely matters the way they're designed on the back end, right? It matters if I'm building these up with a government that we don't trust, that is a centralized database, or if I'm using these to actually allow an access to services or a, a self-sovereign identity type-based solution, that would uh, not risk some of those downsides. And maybe just to name a couple of um, examples of, of the downsides that have emerged, and I think international organizations and governments are becoming more conscious of that. There, one is just a matter of data breach if you start collecting all this biometric and personal data, like the International Red Cross, right, that was hacked, um, where the information of over 500,000 recipients uh, was, was basically just stolen um, to other people. And the other example was that uh, in Afghanistan last summer, that when um, Western forces and international humanitarian agencies left, there was biometric databases in various forms and collection information put into the hands of the Taliban. So, you know, if as we're also looking in the international space in this area, it's like, what types of safeguards are we putting in place? And I just want to end with one other final example though. And this is just because it also illustrates that this is all just kind of still in an experimentation phase, but we're almost having a live test of what potential good some of this technology could do as the case of Ukraine where the international DIA system, right, that was put in place in 2020, um, digital ID national system with um, personal identification documents, but also access to service. Over 3 million Ukrainians had already signed up for it. And it's actually now being used to provide essential links, services, but also with neighboring countries in order to speed up the verification process. Um, so I think, there's many questions involved in that and who has access to these services, but there's no reason why we shouldn't use these types of thinking and also to better use this technology going forward. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up that example because um, I think when we eventually pivot to possibilities, that was going to be one of my, uh, you know, the, the types of um, uh, access to protection that Ukrainians are getting outside of Ukraine right now, thanks to digital technologies, has really not been seen in displacement context before. 
Uh, we're, we're working on a short piece of CSIS on this right now. Um, of course, it potentially opens up a new digital protection space um, that, that we can talk about uh, as well. But I'm glad you you brought that up. Um, I, I'm going to um, actually we have an audience question that's Jessica related to what something that you said. So um, Petra and Santiago, I want to go to you in a minute on this uh, question of what regulations and policies are needed. But if I can pull this thread on digital ID just a, a little bit with you, Jessica, Brian Martin says, he asks, how does the European Commission's European Health Data Space Initiative intersect with the issues of cross-border digital I identity management? That is an excellent question. I have to say, I don't know anything about the specific initiative in health and, and space data that he's referring to. What I do know, of course, there's a in individual European countries also these digital ID systems underway. Um, the question then is, of course, who is included in these digital ID systems and how how are we going to treat asylum and refugee seekers, migrants, third country national in these systems? Um, but there's also an other developments. For example, in 2023, the European Union is um, rolling out a very specific EU ID wallet based system. So not just for government service, but also for private service. But the architecture behind it, it's really um, based on data minimization principles. So really, if this would work as a cross-border mobility function of, of, of different access to different services, credentials from universities, there I don't see any reason why that couldn't serve as a blueprint also with, say, like-minded countries to manage human mobility going forward. Um, but that is based on certain privacy protection standards um, and does not always go in, in the opposite direction, um, which, which my colleagues on the panels here have, have already mentioned. So I don't think maybe to answer that question, it's an inevitability that it always needs to go uh, into the surveillance or into the danger realm. Um, but we do need uh, people like Santiago and Petra and the work they're doing to keep pointing to those dangers as well. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think these technologies, I, I'm not sure that the, the people who design and create these technologies are waking up in the morning and saying, you know, I, I have designed a, a technology to um, track organized crime, and I'm okay with it being used to track irregular migrants in Mexico. Um, and yet, the absence of regulation and policies creates that space for the manipulation of those technologies. And so, Petra, if I could turn to you on this question of um, what regulations and policies you think could could address some of what you're seeing and if i can add a quick question here too on what types of technologies you you kind of rattled through some of them and which which ones are you most concerned about and which ones are, are a little bit more on the annoying but potentially you know not as destructive side sure those are some excellent questions i'll try and get to both of them quickly um I mean, in terms of the governance gap, this is really one of the central issues of, of the corpus of my work over the last few years is to really try and highlight what needs to be regulated and what kind of um, governance and um, accountability mechanisms we really need. I mean, I think there are some promising um, opportunities. Uh, so like I said, I've been spending a lot of my time in the European Union and the EU last year tabled its proposed regulation on artificial intelligence, which again is not uh, binding yet. It is still going through the really slow process of regulatory lawmaking in the EU. But it's a really interesting time right now because there's still opportunities to influence amendments to the AI Act, including on border technologies. So, and when, when this actually comes into force, it will be really the first regional attempt to govern something as opaque and, and broad as, as AI. And there's been a lot of different discussions about whether there should be prohibitions or red lines uh, or abolition of, of particular technologies such as AI lie detectors used at borders, which again is not a far-fetched future project, but this is actually being piloted already through the iBorder Control Project, Avatar and others. There's also, a, a, so I'm, I'm just in terms of full disclosure, I've been part of a coalition group of, of academics and civil society trying to formulate some of these amendments and, and send them to the members of the European Parliament to try and get them to think about what else should be changed in the Act. And we're, for example, calling for an outright ban on the use of predictive analytics that can be used for interdictions at and around the border. I mean, if if we just speak plainly, we're, we're concerned about pushback operations, which is something that happens around European shores 
Um, and of course, there's similar practices at other borders around the world too. So for me, this is where, perhaps this is where it gets at your second question, Errol. Some of these sharpest manifestations of the technology is what I'm most concerned about, the kind of border violence that is historical, but exacerbated through these new technological tools that again, powerful actors like states and intergovernmental organizations too now have um, at their disposal. And I think this is where there's that conflation between the fact that there's such a geopolitical appetite, this so-called AI arms race that some have called it, to develop and deploy technology um, for these purposes without thinking through or even having to think through about governance and regulation. Because at the end of the day also, I think it's important to pull apart the political economy that we're talking about here. And I think we've all already alluded to it. There's big money to be made in, in border tech. And it's very clear that private sector actors get to set the stage in terms of not only what is developed and why, but also the, the priority setting. I mean, I think there's a reason why we're developing AI lie detectors to be tested out on migrants and refugees and not using AI to root out racist border guards. I mean, those are particular decisions that get made. And again, all of this occurs because there's a lack of governance and regulation. So we have a lot to do on this particular uh, side of things, I believe. Santiago, similar question to you or, or series of questions on kind of what types of regulations and policies you think should be needed and, and what what um, manifestations of these technologies are you most concerned about here more a little bit more at the the uh, sea level? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Harold. Um, so we are seeing uh, that in many in many cases, the adoption of, of surveillance technology in this context, but in, in a more broad, broader context of, of security in Mexico is happening uh, also because there's uh, like the thoughts of uh, public opinion. Public opinion thinks that uh, these technologies are like super efficient and really useful. But this narrative is also uh, like nurtured by, by, the, by companies. We have seen brochures where uh, companies uh, are se are selling this this equipments to government and government like uh, takes for example phrases from these brochures and and, and puts them in in their in their uh, narratives. So uh, we are we are worried that uh, there needs to be um, in the level of acquisition there should also be uh, uh, controls and limits uh, because we are also seeing that for example. Uh, the National, National Institute for, for Migration in Mexico is acquiring these surveillance tools and they don't have the, the faculties of using of even using these tools or, or of even buying these systems. And this happens uh, in, in many other cases. In Mexico, we have seen that, uh, for example, um, electoral institutes are buying uh, also surveillance equipment. So, I think we, we need to, to also think on, on limits and on, on, on laws that prevent even the acquisition of, this, of these technologies for a start. Um, what we have also seen is that in many cases, when we um, find that these tools are being abused, uh, it's really hard to investigate who used the, these tools or, or where are they. Sometimes they, they, they get lost, uh, the government uh, doesn't know who is using these tools inside the government. They are using also like um, even they are blocking access to the uh, general prosecutor's office, uh, saying that that, that there are uh, national security uh, confidentiality. So we also need. We think we also need uh, registries of these equipments. Uh, they may may be or may not be public, but the, these registries would be really useful for for the investigative powers in the government to when there are cases of abuses, for example. Um, so these these are I mean there there are other other stuff that we have been thinking about uh, in in civil society, um, but these are like uh, two of the most important I would say. Um, in the case, go go ahead, Evo. Oh, please continue. Uh, just answering uh, really quick your second uh, question. Uh, right now, we are really um, 
what uh, the the technology of uh, biometric identification in the case of of Mexico uh, is like really worrying to us because we are we are seeing that uh, migrants that are uh, in the narrative of the government uh, rescued, uh, which they are more like uh, stopped and detained, and um, uh, they are facing uh, that they have to give their data uh, in in order they can they can keep moving through the through the country. So and we are not we don't know how this data is being used and and what's the effects on on on. I mean, we know a little bit of how it, it has been used. We we got like some access to some emails from uh, custom border border patrol that they are having like uh, conversations with the government, the Mexican government, and they are uh, like uh, cross referencing this data to to deport um, migrants, basically. So we need to uh, have more transparency in this in this sector, and we are really worried because of, of this kind of abuses. Yeah, I think this is this is a key point. I mean, what what I'm hearing from all of you is this is not just about privacy of migrants, which is important, um, but there are real world physical implications of the manipulation of these technologies, whether it's the deportation or along the way, kind of the the exploitation or or the incarceration even of, of folks uh, as they're moving. And of course, goes without saying that these a lot of times are very vulnerable people that uh, don't really have ways of protecting themselves digitally or physically. Um, and so these technologies are sort of being manipulated in, in that way. Um, there's a really interesting audience question here that is, a, is a, I think, a subset of what we've been talking about. So Caroline Kay uh, asked, what soft controls, and she puts that in quotes, could be used or promoted amongst those developing these technologies, by that I'm assuming like companies developing these technologies to protect against unintended consequences. So are there international norms that have been developed and distributed? I would add, is there something that is should be part of the IMRF and the, the sort of global compact follow-on process that is involved and this, and maybe Jessica, I can start with you since you're in, in New York. How do you think about that? Yeah, sure. And um, thanks also for that question. It's an important one. You know, I would say at the end of the day, because we're dealing with the migration refugee space and for the reasons we just mentioned, you know, it's we don't want to end up with just soft, soft norms on, on regulating this. But in order to get there, I think there's some things, areas emerging you know, right before regulation um, that we can look at and that we need to look at, um, you know, as decision makers, as civil society, as anyone working in the space. And uh, Petra already mentioned sort of the EU AI Act. That's that's one important regulation coming up. But if you look at, um, you know, coming from the digital rights or digital governance side of things, there are, I think, already many models that we could start looking at to be used in the migration space. And I can give a couple of examples. Um, for example, when it comes to algorithmic accountability, right? We've been having these discussions um, in, in our publics, at least for the last few years, about the unintended consequences of having these algorithmic decisions uh, being made and, and all these unintended consequences, anything from bias, discriminatory outcomes, um, and they were just rolled out. So um, what some... Um, what some organizations have been doing um, is, you know, algorithmic accountability in the public sector. And the question is, what would that look like in the migration and refugee space? Say, if we agree that some form of algorithm could be, for example, used in visa processing, it's going to make a big difference whether this algorithm is just used to categorize, for example, legal labor migrations according to the profession they do, or how complete an application is, or if we're actually going to be using it to do um, sort of a scoring classification to see in which order visas are processed or if visas are outright denied. That makes a big difference. The nature of the visa processes or what we've mentioned before also means that governments aren't necessarily going to make public by the rules by which they choose that. So we need to start asking the questions that you have in other AI-based applications is, what could maybe an oversight board or another mechanism look like within these systems so that we don't abuse the trust, that we still maintain trust in those systems. So I think those are maybe just some of the, the 
more softer norm building things that are emerging. Um, and you see this maybe in international consultation processes on, on what should safe legal digital IDs look like. But it's really connecting these dots back to the migration, refugee protection or human mobility more broadly um, that I think needs to happen. And that's going to also require political questions that we need to answer. And that's things sort of, are we going to build into our models or into a prerequisite of human mobility, social scores that other countries are using on people, right? And are we going to start doing that? Or do we want a different system built on different values? And I think that's where my wish would be to, to have all those governance, but also political and values-based questions in one place um, as we build the system actually on human mobility going forward. Yeah, and I think the global compact follow-on process allows for an opportunity for that to happen. Um, as as folks who follow this space will know, and Petra as a lawyer will know, there's there's not any teeth associated with the global compact, but as a norm setting uh, institution and, and document and, and convening, you know, this IMRF is part of the, the follow on for this. And it's, it's an important exercise from that perspective. So Petra, when you think about these, this question of uh, soft controls for those uh, companies developing technologies, um, how do you how do you think about that, and, and what's their role in, in all of this? It's a really good question. I mean, I think it really gets at what what Jessica was leaving us with, and the fact that really it's about broader questions that we have to ask about the kind of societies that we want to live in and the kind of world building that we are engaged in, particularly in these uncertain, difficult times globally speaking. I think again these times of exception and crisis and, and and everything make a lot of technological development happen in some troubling ways and, and as you said as well the private sector and the companies that are involved are able to do this particularly because so little governance and regulation exists i mean i think we actually have to pare down the conversation in, in some way and really think about what is it that we're doing and why? What is inevitable? And and what have we decided that we're okay with as a society? I mean, I feel like sometimes we've we've leapfrogged over some fundamental questions. And one of the reasons why this happens, I think, again, is it is about power and, and who gets to co-opt the particular spaces of conversation when it comes to technological innovation. And I mean, if I can be <laughs> bold, it, it's 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 even spaces like this that have to be problematized and critiqued. And the fact that it is a little bit of an echo chamber when when we have lawyers and critics and civil society kind of talking to each other and then at the international scale, but not actually involving the voices of people on the ground who are experiencing this this sharp technology themselves. I mean, I think we really need to have more interdisciplinary cross cutting conversations. And perhaps that is also one way to, to move forward is and, and Errol, you were alluding to this before, right? I think a lot of the, the tech companies and the private sector actors you know, maybe we can give them the benefit of the doubt once in a while. I don't do that a lot in my work, but I will for the sake of this conversation. I mean, I think perhaps people don't really imagine that their technology that they're developing is then going to be used to incarcerate refugees or be used in the criminal justice system for predictive policing or for welfare algorithms. But they have to start thinking about that because it is part of the kind of world making that we are all a part of. And the only way that we will do that is to have these conversations across different backgrounds, different sectors, different disciplines. Um, I know it sounds maybe a bit simplistic because, of course, on top of that, also, we need the soft um, normative setting conversations and then also the hard line law governance and regulatory mechanisms. But I think it has to start from this foundational idea of what, what is it that we're really doing here and who gets to decide. And even the global compact, right? I mean, the, the, the first... Um, section of it talks about data and 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 want needing more 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 data for migration management is that really what we want is that the first kind of idea is that the way that we want this compact to kind of uh, be thought about or are there other ways to perhaps think about how to improve the the management of migration i think there's a lot of deep philosophical questions that we're just not asking ourselves as a sector and, and as society generally yeah and, and i think getting to the private sector point as well, I, I'm not sure that if if they if the companies know how technologies are being manipulated, um, perhaps it's it's not coming at a cost to them. That manipulation is not coming at a cost 
for, for example, from a public relations perspective or something. And so perhaps one of the way forwards is just to sort of highlight how technology is being manipulated. Santiago gave a bunch of really good examples. Petra, you've got some examples from Lesbos as well. And, and just highlight that may be the goal for some of these countries. They may not, or companies, they may not care. Um, but I think for a lot of them, um, especially in, in today's day and age where people are tuned in and, and, you know, one TikTok video can, can pose a lot of challenges for, for a multinational corporation. So Santiago, can I go over to you? I'm going to come back to Jessica and Petra and Santiago on this possibilities question. Um, Jessica, you talked a little bit about, um, the Ukraine example of, of where you, you see technology uh, benefiting, and I would add, you know, are there ways that technology can can be used to protect migrants? But before we get to that, Santiago, can I ask uh, Caroline's question to you as well about this sort of soft controls, uh, self regulation, um, international norms that can help companies uh, sort of be better in this space? Yeah, um, I would say I'm also a bit pessimistic on this side because of what we have seen uh, around how uh, these companies like uh, face uh, the allegations against the use of, of their equipment in human against human rights so but um, in a more like uh, a more pragmatic way I would say that it would be really useful that companies uh, that develop these tools uh, develop also mechanisms for uh, out, out Auditioning, auditioning how how this this equipment is being used, and also uh, mechanisms to stop uh, or suspend the service if if they detect that this service is being used against human rights. Um, because as as I as I said earlier, many times um, or or uh, like. In the in the case of the use of, of Pegasus in Mexico, the in the investigations, uh, the uh, we started to ask the the company or or more like the uh, general prosecutor office started to ask the company if they knew how 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 the Pegasus has was used, and the company like answered that they don't know that they don't have information about their logs and and which. I mean, we don't know. Maybe, maybe they have, and they are like hiding this information. But it would be really useful if, from the side of the companies, we could also uh, have access to how how these technologies are being used, and, and and in the cases where they are being abused, have the from the complete information to to go against these these abuses. Yeah. I, I think you hit on a, a really great norm and and takeaway that I'm going to take away from this event about you know, companies needing to build into the development of that technology, a way of tracking how it's being utilized and then putting in safeguards for when it's being utilized in ways that, that infringe upon people's human rights. It seems, seems like something that should be feasible in, in the year of our Lord 2022. Um, easier said than done perhaps, and could, could impact the bottom line of some of these companies. But I think that's where, again, the sort of norms uh, and, and international policies conversation comes in. Uh, thank you all for, for that. That was really interesting. Jessica, you, you mentioned Ukraine. I wonder if you had any other, you know, how do you think about the possibilities of technology and migration management? I, I feel like if we were having this conversation 25 years ago, we would have been um, saying, oh, this is great. You know, we're getting rid of the need to have all of this bureaucracy. I grew up in Turkey, and if you wanted anything to get done, you had to take a piece of paper from here and then take it over to that office and across town and get a stamp and everything. And, and there was a lot of, I think, optimism about how this would really smooth out systems and, and allow for international travel um, and, and migration to happen more effectively and, and perhaps efficiently. And I think in a lot of ways that has. Now, the, the people who envision those systems perhaps didn't envision some of the, the ways that those technologies can be manipulated. But, but how do you think about this possibilities of technology in, in this space? Yes, thanks, Errol. And I guess 
as I mentioned at the very beginning, I think we're finally starting to come to a point, um, but also thanks to the work of civil society actors, but also others of actually thinking about these technologies more critically um, and not to just jump um, also as governments or as other actors to these technologies as this idea that they would save things, that they will fix things that are actually a governance or a policy issue in our world. Um, and so to have a much more careful look at that. That having said, I think, you know, starting to dig deeper into the specific use cases can allow us to have sort of a constructively critical mindset in the use of these in order to get to the governance questions that we mentioned. And if we do so, in that case, they can have a positive impact. This would include, like Petra mentioned, involving those people affected in the design phase. This involves in the ministries having what we call bilinguals, right? People that understand the technology or that may be programming the technology, but also the policy implications. We need much more spaces and conversations like that as governments and other actors are thinking about employing these technologies. And if that is done though, then I think under those conditions, we can start talking and thinking about, okay, these are actually positive use cases. And um, there are different ones, but I can just think, for example, in, in labor migration policies where um, recruitment, getting visas in so many countries in the world and so many embassies is so cumbersome where people have to wait unnecessarily long just because of things that haven't been properly digitized or haven't been where just technological tools can actually help allowing for more um, mobility and more mobility options. So that would be one area. Another one was, and I know this is where it gets very uh, tricky also with what, what Petra was referring to, you know, predictive modeling that is that is being used, forecasting models in many ministries. They're also being used for sort of crisis management, crisis early warning forecasting systems um, that can actually be used to help um, in, in certain situations to better calibrate policy responses to allocate financial resources. But we always need to evaluate them with a view of what are they going to be used for. Um, and, you know, one humanitarian agency decided not to use a model to predict where people would go to because it could be used by governments for sort of more draconian measures to close borders, etc. But now their model is only predicting a general, um, general levels of displacement within a given region without even trying to predict where people were moved to, right? And I think that that's one example of that the type of conversations of the use of technologies that we really have a responsibility to 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 have. Yeah, that that's great. And Petra and, and Santiago, I. I get the sense, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I get the sense you're a little bit more on the perils rather than the possibilities end of this uh, spectrum. But so I'm, I'm happy if you have any sort of uh, possibility related answers, but, but you know, even if you don't, kind of what are some not positive use cases, but, but maybe cases where you're seeing technology deployed for migration management that are adequately safeguarding people like are, are there examples where we can learn from where this is actually being deployed effectively uh, petra so i think it's yeah pretty clear that i'm very much on the peril side of things and the sharpest edges of, of uh, technology but i will say for me what i find um a big possibility and, and, and quite hopeful is again drilling down and looking at what's happening within communities themselves, potentially as acts of resistance to violent border practices, different innovative communication tools um, that people on the move themselves are using. I mean, there's a lot of innovation again happening from within the community. And I think that's really what we need to highlight too in this space, that again, it has to be in conversation with the people who are affected because technology is already being used in some very creative and innovative ways. Um, on the, the kind of um, types of tech that, that we've been talking about, I, I am always a bit hard pressed to find some, some positive possibilities. So I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Fair enough. Santiago? I think I share my point of view with, with Petra. Uh, we, are, we are seeing uh, a lot of adoption in the migration communities of, of uh, as I said, social networks and other te technological tools to, to gather, to communicate, to keep communication, also to be more secure into which route they, routes are the, the safest routes. Also, when facing uh, a lot of lack of communication and, and 
also misinformation around around all these issues. These tools has, have been like really use, useful for the for the community. So I, I think we should. But there's also there's also like a, a great um, opportunity there, like to to I would say to um, to make these environments more secure for these communities and 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 to and to see what their needs are and, and to develop. Uh, with them, uh, uh, tools that are uh, like uh, giving them more and more safety in this environment. So, th so there's also like uh, opportunities there. I, I would say. Yeah, I think an opportunity and an obligation. You know, to, we're not going to stop the utilization of technology here. Um, I, I think that that ship has sailed. That train has left the station. Technology will be a part of human mobility management. We're not going to go back to the days of pen and paper. And so I think efforts, I would hope that future IMRS and, and you know, global migration conferences and local migration conferences, Petra, as you mentioned, um, talk about how we can better utilize and safeguard the, the rights of, of migrants um, in, in utilizing these technologies. Um, I really, really want to thank the, the three panelists. And before I let them go, I always like to to ask one final question. If there's a tweet length takeaway, um, and so this can be either 240 characters or 480, depending on your version of Twitter that you prefer, but sort of a tweet length takeaway for the audience. What what do you want people to take away from, from this conversation? So Jessica, maybe I'll start with you and then Petra and last words of Santiago. I haven't spelled this out, so I don't know if it's tweetable, but I will I will try my best. But I would say that the question is not whether digital technologies will really change how we think about migration and human mobility management going forward, but how we employ these technologies and according to which rules and principles. And we are currently only building this sort of digital nervous system of managing human mobility going forward. And it's really up to us to set the standards and to set that digital infrastructure right now to the world that we actually want to live in. Thanks so much. Petra? So I'm going to cheat a bit, and I'm actually going to read off a tweet of mine from, from a while back. Not read off, but basically, I'm going to be a bit radical and say that there should be um, a moratorium, if not outright abolition, of some of the sharpest, most harmful border technologies, unless and until there are stronger governance and regulatory mechanisms in place, because these technologies hurt people. That's my tweet. I, I have, I think I've asked this question at every public event that I've done at CSIS and it's the first time that someone has actually read a tweet. So uh, <laughs> prize goes to Petra. Santiago, uh, last word to you. I'll do my best. Uh, I would say that uh, tech surveillance is, uh, is being used to put, uh, to stop migration from, from, from having movement and it's, this is putting their lives at risk. Thanks to Santiago Narvaez, Petra Molnar, and Jessica Byther. Uh, I also want to thank um, our research at CSIS on this topic. It's funded by the Open Society Foundation, and I'm doing this. Um, I'm in our international security program at CSIS, and I'm doing this with my friend and colleague, Marty Flax, at the CSIS Human Rights Initiative. Um, and so we, we thought we would limit the number of CSIS uh, voices in this event, and so I chose the, I got the short, Stick, uh, out of that uh, choice, but I'm so glad that I did because this was really an amazing conversation. I, I could talk to all three of you in Mexico City and Lesbos and, and New York City, uh, although you, Jessica, normally sit in Berlin, um, and I could talk to you all day about these really important issues. It sounds like we're just scratching the surface, and, and this is uh, the beginning of what should be a longer um, conversation about the, the role, the perils, and the possibilities of technology utilization and, and migration management. So thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks again to the panelists. Thanks to Catherine Zuki and Anastasia Srivolos on my CSIS team for, for helping out, for Eric and the streaming and broadcasting team. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.